the norm, evoking, um, these things don't occur ordinarily in human metabolism. Masculine might under certain conditions. But the, the major psychedelic neurotransmitters are what are represented in ayahuasca. <coughs> so it's, uh, and it's the only hallucinogen I know where if it's made right, the next day, the day after the experience, you actually feel better than if you hadn't done it. I mean, even with mushrooms, which is dear to my heart, the day afterwards, I tend to keep the phone unplugged and to, you know, hot baths and this and that. But on ayahuasca, you're just ready for action at 4 o'clock the next morning if necessary. <coughs> and the hallucinations are extraordinary. They seem to occur, in a way it seems more versatile than psilocybin. The hallucinations can range over a wider range. I mean, they can be anything from nature-based, botanical, insectile, to just, you know, you name it. I remember one one period of hallucination on ayahuasca where it was gold Egyptian hieroglyphics against black and moving through these tunnels and, the, and this sort of thing. And it's very, uh, I think it's safe. It's probably used by more people than any other psychedelic plant cult in the world if you don't consider cannabis a plant cult. And as a strong hallucinogen, you know, in in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, down into Bolivia, uh, and then it's made inroads in the 20th century in a big way into Brazil, portions of Argentina, and then more sophisticated populations all over the world are getting, getting wind of this. Are there any questions yeah. about it? Will it grow in my camera? Oh, yeah, it'll grow. It grows well in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. It could, many, many plants are, um, have more restricted ranges than their natural capacity. Mm -hmm. Plants, most plants have not occupied their full range. This is a consequence of the glaciers only having melted 20,000 years ago. Ayahuasca, uh, I mean, one of the things that interests me that I've talked to Stress Blusher about is um, I think that there may be Banisteriopsis of some sort implicated in Mayan religion. Nobody has ever been able to prove this, but there is a whole elaborate kind of Mayan symbolism that you see at Kalenka, uh, I'm sorry, that you see at Tulum mm -hmm. and at other sites that's called umbilical symbolism. And I think these things that have been taken for umbilical cords are probably vines of some sort. The last time I was at Tikal, in the ruins themselves, there were many yellow flowers, Malthagaceous flowers on the ground that had clearly been shed by large vines which you could see going up into the canopy. And I collected in Belize uh, non-flowering mouth of Gatesia vines that I was unable to distinguish from ayahuasca. So, you know, this, this may well be happening um, or could have been happening among the classic minds. And the, exactly what their drugs were and who used them is pretty speculative at this point. There's no trace of that in the current mind population? Well, there's, I mean, no trace of, of vine use. No, they're pretty, I think, the morning glory seeds, the mushrooms among the Sierra Mazatec and Indians, the Zapotec and the Mixtec, uh, among the Maya, uh, I think the morning glory complex and the Salvia divinorum. And, but whatever else may have gone on, you know, there's a whole, I mean, Jonathan is the expert on this, but there's a whole number of plants which may have been uh, used for their psychoactive effect in Mexico. Various coleuses, the Emia salicifolia, some people believe certain water lilies, um, Oh, plants like Quarera dia fumibres, even, which 
is now used as a flavoring for certain kinds of chocolate drinks, still there are depictions on pieces of statuary that seem to suggest that maybe this would have a narcotic style of usage in the past. <coughs> I have, a, yeah. uh, I have a question about, uh, you're talking about uh, how you, the visual experience was driven by uh, sound. Right. Uh, have you found that the vision could be driven by anything else? Any other uh, uh, occurrences besides sound? Uh, touch or, or... Well, I tend to see. lie down and sit still in silent darkness. Um, I suppose cannabis helps most of these things. But really, the ayahuasca is extraordinary. The last time I, I took it to, was in a non-traditional setting, but with one other person, and sitting in completely silent darkness, and this guy had uh, these Tibetan chimes, you know, the kind you strike with a piece of deer horn, mm -hmm. and it would be completely silent, and he would strike this thing, and it would, it would literally it would form a piece of jewelry or a thing like a machine in the air. Just, just this thing, and the thing would come <laughs> into being as long as the sound was there, and then it would disappear. And then he would make another one, and it was very clear that we were seeing the same thing because I commented on it and said and described what I was seeing, and it looked like a little thing made out of iridescent <coughs> titanium with brass connectors and it was like an enormous laurel birch earring or something like that. <laughs> it's a very specific kind of, of object. Um, I think these things are very mysterious. I mean, it, it was a pity that um, that Rocio's English didn't allow a real discussion of uh, these stories about the people who disappear for days and weeks on end who go into a parallel world. Because, you know, if you if you just think that these aboriginal people are ignorant savages, well then you can just dismiss it. But if you have gotten this far on the premise that shamans know what they're talking about, well then you have to take very seriously this more outlandish stuff. You know, I mean how, where do you draw the line, you know? And ayahuasca is, you know, Eduardo Luna, who some of you know, is uh, very keen to insist that what ayahuasca is really about is where you get on it if you keep these diets for weeks and months and then take it repeatedly over and over in these situations of sensory deprivation. And I think these people are basically erasing uh, ordinary uh, linguistic structures and they live in a world half, perhaps more than half hallucination. And their fears of magical attack and their relationships to invisible beings and all this is uh, a kind of, I suppose, in Western terms, the only thing you could say is it's a kind of self-generated, self-controlled schizophrenia. But that's just the word schizophrenia. I mean, what it is is it's a self-generated, self-controlled immersion in a non-causal, parallel um, construct of some sort. And the reason shamans live in isolation and on the periphery of modern and high-density urban civilization is essentially so that they can build these castles in the air that they inhabit. They build unique mythological structures that are like accretions of their very powerful personalities. That's what all this storytelling is about. It's these stories are, are the contextual define the contextual limits of what is possible. And if you live in a culture where night after night